I heard Art say earlier this morning, are we singing an amen on this one? And uh, they were just trying to get everything straight. As the Beatles generation, what is our expression? How many of you were part of the Beatles generation? We, we were the class of 64. That was the year of the Beatles. Um, and what was the song that they sang that was the equivalent to amen? Let it be. Yeah, that's, that's basically what amen be means. Let it be. Let it be. Um, and certainly as we sing that great hymn, that's a uh, good way to end it, isn't it? Let it be, Lord. Praise and adoration be thine. Let it be. We begin this morning a study of uh, highlights from Jeremiah. I could spend years in Jeremiah. Um, he is a fascinating character. Uh, sometimes I identify with him. Sometimes I feel like, uh, how do you emulate him? Other times I feel like, come on, Jeremiah, get your chin up. Uh, he is one of those guys. Uh, I have uh, been enriched by two studies, one that I have read over and over again for years, and which when I first prepared sermons on Jeremiah, I used as a guideline, and it's uh, called Jeremiah the Prophet Who Wouldn't Quit. And uh, this was a book I required all my youth ministry students to read. Uh, you know, they would look at me like, what are we doing reading Jeremiah in a youth ministry class? Well, uh, I would explain to them, one of the things you'll find out in ministry is there will be time after time in your lifetime when you feel like quitting or everybody's quitting on you. Uh, and if you study the prophet Jeremiah, you'll find out a bit of what it means in ministry uh, to be determined never to quit. Uh, but one of the things, uh, this is written by William Peterson, and I, uh, like most of the books that are my favorite books, it's no longer in print. Um, but thanks be to Amazon, uh, you can probably look it up uh, on Amazon and uh, you will find both new and used copies available. Uh, and it's Peterson spelled with an E at the end, S-E-N. Uh, and uh, one of the things he's very helpful in and we need to warn each other about is that as you read the book of Jeremiah, it is not written chronologically. In fact, most ancient literature is not done chronologically. Every once in a while, there will be parts of it where uh, there'll be some chronology, but uh, they didn't care. The ancients didn't care about that kind of order. They never would have been phys ed majors. They didn't keep neat notebooks they didn't make their games go orderly. As something came to mind, the ancients would say, this will be good for the story. And so as they would write it, they didn't make it up. They just put it in whatever order gave the greatest effect. So part of what is involved in the study of Jeremiah, and because it is a long book, um, as you read the various incidents, you kind of have to do detective work to figure out where in the history of Judah this takes place. And since Jeremiah's career began in the, uh, his life began during the, uh, the reign of Manasseh, one of the most evil kings of all time, uh, and then uh, he received his call during the reign of Josiah, the boy king, uh, Josiah and Jeremiah were po both probably late teens, early 20s when Josiah or Jeremiah received his call to ministry. And then he continues throughout the reign of several kings until Jerusalem is destroyed and burned and dead bodies are lying in the streets. Um, so it is quite a long lifetime 
His body was destroyed by the time he was done. He had been beaten uh, and treated poorly so often, imprisoned. Uh, and yet, uh, as much as he ran it and railed and cried, he is also known as uh, the weeping prophet. Uh, he never quit. He never quit. He was faithful to the end. Uh, so if you want to kind of get some of that straight and uh, read some of the outstanding highlights of his life and ministry, uh, Peterson's With an E book is a great book. And then recently, our women's Bible study studied Run with the Horses by the other Peterson, with whom you are more familiar, Eugene Peterson. Um, and uh, I've been using this uh, lately with my quiet time. Boy, do I have some great quiet times these days between the Diary of Private Prayer and then walking along uh, with uh, Eugene Peterson as he reflects on the life of Jeremiah. Um, and I would highly recommend this to you as well. He again tries to create where in the life of Jeremiah some of the incidents in the biblical account took place. It's interesting that Jeremiah scholars disagree sometimes and they do it with a kind of smile on their face because sometimes it's really difficult to tell what was going on when the Lord gave Jeremiah a certain word about what he was hearing. But there's no question about uh, what is happening in our scripture lesson this morning. It is the first chapter and it's the call of Jeremiah. I mentioned very briefly a week or two ago, the dramatic calling of Isaiah, uh, where the Lord calls him. We didn't have a chance to study that text, but it doesn't occur it until the sixth chapter of Isaiah. Uh, and you all know the song. Uh, preachers uh, have it sung at their installation services and their ordination services. Uh, uh, Here I am, Lord. Um, I will follow. Uh, how many of you have sung? that song. Uh, that, that was Isaiah's response when the Lord said, who's going to go? Who is going to obey my call? And Isaiah says, here I am, Lord, send me. Well, Jeremiah says, here I am, Lord, send them. <laughs> Very similar to Moses. If you'll recall the incident of Moses at the burning bush. It's the, the uh, who, me? That is the call of Jeremiah, and uh, let's take a look at it uh, this morning. Let me give you a little geography that we need to remember. I'm right where I was before. I'm Jerusalem and Judah, and you'll see if you're wondering what that is on your sermon outline, and I'd encourage you to hold on to this. Uh, it's actually the geography uh, of the times, uh, and you'll see Babylonia all the way over there to the east, and you'll see the Assyrian Empire up to the northeast of us, and up on the coast, uh, uh, under uh, the reign of the Assyrian Empire is Phoenician. Down here to the southeast of us, uh, below the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea, uh, is Edom. Uh, and the role they'll play is when Jerusalem falls and they're being carted off, the Edomites, uh, much to the chagrin uh, of Jeremiah, uh, and he will mention it in his lamentations, kind of like David, you'll get yours, Edomites, because they laugh at the uh, Judahites, the Israelites, as they're being carted off to Babylonia. Uh, and that's where the Edomites kind of figure in with all of this. And to our southwest, back behind the ban, uh, is Egypt. Uh, and what will happen during Jeremiah's lifetime is that uh, the kings, and uh, the first king he serves under is Josiah, uh, he's the only good king. All the rest of them are just awful. And they will try to bargain with Egypt 
They will be vassals to Assyria. When Assyria falls, they will try to please the Babylonians who always have them encircled and conquer all the lands around them. Uh, but they'll just play games to try to fool the Babylonians and uh, they won't fool anyone. Before it's over, the Babylonians will have con conquered the Assyrians and that empire will be destroyed. Uh, then the Babylonians will rule. And just uh, toward the end of the time, while Daniel is still living um, uh, and will live quite a bit longer, the Babylonians will be conquered by the <laughs> Persians. They will be conquered by the Persians. And the Persians will be conquered by, they had a young king who was called the Great, Alexander the Great, the Greeks will conquer the Persians slash Medes, and the Greeks will be conquered by the time of Christ, the Romans, yes. Um, just to give you a feel of the sweep of world history that is occurring at this time. Hear the word of the Lord from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 1. It's quarter to 10, uh, or quarter to 11, and I'm going to get in big trouble if I don't end on time this morning, because we have cooks out there that are counting on it. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin. Just a curiosity, no one knows who Hilkiah really is. He, he was a priest. Um, and he was from this town of priests, Anathoth, that was about three miles northeast of Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, other than one line that we have in the annals of the king, shortly after Josiah, the boy king, became king, and how the son of such a sadistic, awful king like Manasseh and at one point, Manasseh repents, and God restores him to his throne, but he never really thoroughly changes his way. Somehow, late in his life, there is a child born to him named Josiah, and he has a longing for God. So the temple is in ruins. And this king, who is very young, gives an order to have the temple restored and cleaned out. And a priest comes to him and says, look what I found, the book of the law. Can you imagine? Only a generation from now, one of our great-grandchildren coming to the local commissioners and saying, Commissioner of Conquer Township, look what I found in the ruins over there behind that old electric sign, a little ways up the hill from there. It's a holy Bible. Can you believe it? The name of the priest was Hilkiah. And scholars have kind of gone, do you think? Do you think it was Jeremiah's father? He would have been serving as a priest at this time. And I have the answer to that question, scholar that I am, I don't know. <laughs> and all the honest scholars will say, it's kind of a fascinating little detail, but Hilkiah was not exactly an unheard of name, uh, but Jeremiah's father would have been serving at a priest this time. I kind of suspect that if it was him, there would probably be more of a mention about it here. You know, it would have said, son of Hilkiah, the priest that found the, the scroll of the law. But that was the beginning of a mini revival of the culture of Jerusalem at that time led 
by the only good king during the time of Jeremiah. And you can just imagine how it was to Jeremiah, how it felt to him. Some of you are looking around, the women back in the kitchen are thinking, people are actually here. Oh, goody. And the people in the back thinking, maybe we'll have more children, we're serving food. Ho, ho. Jeremiah's thinking, maybe I won't have to be a prophet. Just because of Josiah and the discovery of the book of the law, they won't need me to proclaim anything. Oh, don't get too full of yourself, Jeremiah. <laughs> Here I am, send them. Nah, it's not going to work that way. So the word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah. Josiah would have been around 21 years old, I believe, 22. Son of Ammon, king of Judah. Ammon lasted about a year and a half. And through the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the 11th year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. The word of the Lord came to me saying, are any of you curious at this point like I continue to be? Do any of you want a little more information from Jeremiah? Don't you want to know how did the word of the Lord come to you? This is how the word of the Lord came to me for this morning. With a little help of, from those two books I showed you and several others. And certainly by the transformation of my heart, which began years ago. Is that what Jeremiah is referring to? I find myself constantly imploring, helplessly, to the writers of the Holy Word, come on, Jeremiah, give us a little more here. How did he come to you? Is it an angel visitation? Better yet, is it the angel of the Lord? The one who, when he came to Abraham, was addressed as Lord? Because a little further on, Jeremiah will refer to the Lord touching his lips. We'll never know. And of course, we always say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask that question. And I suspect when I get to heaven, I won't give a rip. I'll just be so excited about being in the heavenly realm. But for now, just curious how the word of the Lord came to him. But here is what the Lord said. Before I form you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. An awful lot to take in. Alas, sovereign Lord. Jeremiah says, I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. I'm not good at public speaking. I'm just a kid. But the Lord said to him, don't say I'm too young. You must go. This is an option. We'd like you to work with kids on the move this morning if you feel like it. That's not what the Lord's saying here. Jeremiah, you're going, baby. Like it or not, feeling good about it or not, you're going. You must go. And you must say whatever I command you. And oh my, is he going to command him to say some things and do some things that are just, by our standards, ridiculous? I mean, at one point he has him run through the city waving his dirty underwear. Uh, how would you like to get that assignment? Don't be afraid, because I am with you, and I will rescue you. 
And of course, along with that promise goes the fact you're going to be needed to be rescued. That's a little haunting. And then the Lord reached out his hand. I find this fascinating. Was it the angel of the Lord? Or was it merely a vision that was so real that he could actually feel the hands of some kind of image on his lips? We'll never know. And he touched my mouth and he said, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms, Babylonia, Assyria, Phoenicia, Egypt, Edom. I appoint you over all of them whoo, to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow. But keep listening. To build and to plant. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray silently. Some of you are thinking, you're not done yet? Not quite. Let us pray silently for the proclamation of God's word for all of us this morning. Lord, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was a kid, our neighborhood was loaded with boys. And we lived across the street from the Bud property. And there was a strip of land right across the street from our house. And the fence for the first strip of land was so old that you could almost create a hole in it by just grabbing it with your hand. It was so rusty and we would just walk through that fence. In later years, they would take it down and we would play ball, whatever the season was, on that strip of land. Uh, if it was football, it was perfect because it was a straightaway with trees on the other side pine trees on the roadside and then other seedlings that had been planted on the other side and we had this straightaway uh, that made for perfect boundaries for football. For baseball, it, it was a bit of a challenge because uh, you couldn't hit to left or to right. You had to hit right up the middle uh, and you had to orient where you put your players either way. And we would play all kinds of combinations, usually four against four or five against five, depending on who showed up and what we were doing. Well, one particular day, we all got home from school and uh, we, we immediately got changed and we all met at Bud's and uh, we began to confront the idea of how we were gonna choose up size and uh, we had an uneven number. So we were trying to decide who was going to be the captains. Usually the captains were my brother and I because we were the biggest and the fastest. And uh, my brother was the oldest. He was a year older than me. And usually we decided to do whatever he told us to do. But for some reason, he was getting home late. He had a dentist appointment or something, or his bus was different than our bus. There weren't many buses, so I don't know what the situation was. We knew he wasn't there. We knew he would be coming. So I was one of the captains, and someone else was one of the captains, and we did that thing with the bat. How many of you guys remember when you used to do the thing with the bat, and then you had to twist it around your head three times, and then someone would kick it, and if they kicked it out of your hand, they got first choice. If you held on to it, you got first choice. Well, somehow, I got first choice. And I surprised everyone by choosing my brother. And they all said, he's not here. 
I said, that's okay. We'll take them. And they were kind of half smelling the rat because they figured, well, gee, usually he's against you. You know, he's on one side and you're on the other side which if we're on the other side with him, that favors us because he's better than you. But I thought to myself, I'm smarter than you. I'm going to choose him. We're going to be teammates for a change when he shows up. So we began to play. And they build up a little bit of a lead and we spaced our fielders out in such a way that we tried to compensate, and then I looked through the pine trees and saw my mother's car turn into the driveway, and they were back from wherever they were, and I screamed across the street, Rick, hurry up and change, you're on my side! And finally, he comes running through the trees. I mean, it's like the triumphal return of King Arthur. And he says, what? Are we up to bat or are we in the field? I said, we're up to bat, and you're batting such and such. I'm in charge for a change. Very unusual for the baby brother. And the other team is dreading what's going to happen next. Before he ever got there, and I'm sure his first instinct was to say, let's start all over again. But he could see in the agreement of everyone that was there, this is what's happening. You're on John's team. Unusual as that might be. And you know, that's what's happened to all of us. I hope you hear me in the kitchen. You were chosen to prepare this meal. And have fun back there, because we don't really care how good it is. We're just glad we're here. And that's what Jeremiah is told by the Lord. Before I form you in the womb, I knew you. Before you ever got home from the dentist, I set you apart. You're on my team. I appointed you as a prophet to all the nations. And by the way, you don't have a choice here. You may think you do. And along the way, you will make decisions and you will make acts of the will. But you really don't have a choice. I have called you. I have set you apart. Now get your bat. And let's go to work. But wait a second, wait a second. What? I, I don't speak very well. I'm young. Why don't you call my father? He's a priest at the temple. People, people will have more respect for him like anybody had respect for the priest at this point. And then the Lord touches him. Never happened to you? You know that old chorus? I think it's a Gaither chorus. He touched me. He touched me, and oh, I've never been the same. Something happened. Something happened. He touched me and made me whole. The Lord touches his lips. It was my senior year. We were undefeated against every team in the state of Virginia. And we had upset Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech, Nate, we upset Virginia Tech up in Blacksburg. Tell your uncle about that. We upset them. And there was a guy who was in their batting order that uh, I came in to pitch against in relief 
And uh, I rarely struck anybody out, but I struck this guy out to save the game up in Blacksburg. And after the game, he was from Northern Virginia, and he said to one of our guys from Northern Virginia, that was a good pitch. I'll remember that one. It was a low outside curveball. Marla's sitting back there thinking, you forget to get the milk, but you remember the pitch you threw 55 <laughs> years ago. So about a month later, coming into Williamsburg is Virginia Tech. And if we beat them, we clinch at least a tie for the state championship. And the Norfolk and Richmond papers are making a big deal out of all of it. And as they're coming into town, they're lauding these two guys. One is named uh, Dean Hahn, and the other one, I think his first name was John, John Dean. They both had Dean in their name. And they were the number three and four hitters, and they were two of the top hitters in the country. And you would have thought we had lost to them in Blacksburg because the papers were making it look like William and Mary will be lucky to beat these guys. Well, we got off to a quick start, and before you know it, it's the eighth inning, and we're winning five to one. And we have a sophomore pitcher who's pitching, and he is really just controlling the whole game. And it's the eighth inning, and I'm down in the bullpen chewing licorice. And uh, I hated tobacco. Uh, so uh, I would get uh, two bags of Nibs licorice and put them in my back pocket before every game, and I'd put half a bag in my jaw, and I'd have this chaw. Uh, everybody thought I was chewing tobacco because when I would spit, it would come out black. It was Nibs licorice. <laughs> I was down in the bullpen just in enjoying my licorice, rotting my teeth out, having a grand time with the guys down there, and at the beginning of the eighth inning, uh, the coach runs someone down to the bullpen, then he says, have, have King warm up. And uh, so I began kind of calmly warming up. There was no urgency until, with one out, Jim Suplee walked the bases loaded. It's five to one. It's the bases loaded. And Coach Hooker comes walking out to the mound. <laughs> and I'm thinking, he's just going to talk to him. And he turns and he gives me one of those. And you got to be cool. You got to act like you don't have a care in the world. And you kind of half trot from down there in right field onto the mound. And you begin to take your warm up pitchers. And he just gives you the ball says, go get him. The catcher comes out and gives me a little orientation. He really didn't have to. I already knew what was going on. Guess who was up? The number three and four hitters. They not only were good hitters for average, they were power hitters. And there I am. No one would have ever known how scared I was and how helpless I felt. William and Mary had not won a state championship in 25 years. Our coach was on that team. Larger crowd than usual. College baseball doesn't really draw large crowds, but on that particular day, there was all this hype. And, uh, I give up a home run ball here, and it's a grand slammer. I'm in big trouble. I only have two pitches, a fastball and a curve. <laughs> well, I already know that this guy had said, that was a good pitch. I'll be looking for that one. So forget the curveball. But the problem was, my fastball wasn't that fast. I was not one of those overpowering pitchers. I only had one thing going for me. My hands were so small. Usually when a pitcher grips a baseball in his hand, there's like a hole right there in the crook of the hand. Not for me. 
it was choked right into the V of my hand, which had the effect of making your pitch a sinker. Some days it worked, some days it didn't. I started warming up and I kept thinking to myself, please work. Catcher comes out after I warm up, he says, well, uh, what are you feeling? I just said, fastball. He kept signaling for fastballs, and he'd signal for a curveball, I'd shake him off. A couple times, I'd shake him off twice. I only had two pitches, but I shook, shook off both of them, just to confuse everyone. <laughs> then I'd shake it off again until he came back to the one. What God is saying here is, Jeremiah, let me touch my hands to your lips. This is your secret pitch. And it's our secret pitch. He's touched us. But you've got to go out and throw it. You must go, Jeremiah. You must say what I give you to say. I've given you the secret pitch. Trust me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have given all of us a secret pitch. And it's wrapped up in the life and death and resurrection of the Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you this morning that he is in us and we are in him and that he has promised that he will be with us always just as you promised to Jeremiah even to the end of the age. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.